we don't we don't have a counselor or a position. No, I think counselor might be too no. much. But you know, we 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 do have a strong yeah. management team. I think that provides a, a significant <laughs> amount of support. So that's that's something that um, I, I feel um, confident that we have that. We do al Blazing also team. offer assistance through our human resources, and they can you know seek guidance or assistance or counseling services if they would like to mm -hmm. um, receive counseling services or assistance for support and you know whatever context there's a lot of resources out there that we provide to the staff that um we offer yeah. but do we have I, I guess um sometimes this can be so much that sometimes it's beneficial to have somebody on site is there somebody on site they can go to there no we don't have anybody on site that they can go to other than other than us offering the eap or talking to our human resources or right um so they have that resource and actually i mean that that resource is readily available if somebody wanted to um reach out to somebody those resources are you know okay accessible immediately so okay. they they do have that all right thank yeah you. the last thing i was going to talk about was um cement so um <laughs> kind of shifting gears a bit uh this is the uh, oversight report we provide to you. And just again, make sure everyone remembers what we're doing. This is for the construction of the expansion facility, starting in, uh, starting in August with the construction. Um, on intervening months of the board, uh, the board chair and the chair of the investment committee have a lengthy call with Lisa Bladdick, myself, Giselle, and um, go over um, the progress on the work. Um, clearly, we're putting a lot of effort into the bond offering right now, and you heard that at length on the, on the first day. Um, I did want to, before I give you a couple of details on that, I wanted to just mention to you an email I got last night from Lisa Blatnick. And first I thought, well, that can't be true. So I, I, had, I had to write her back and said, is that right? Is that true? So uh, I did want to share it with you as well. Um, our building is uh, managed by Jones Lang LaSalle. They're one of the world's largest uh, property managers, investors in this area in real estate, along with the CBRE and others that work in that business. And um, I will say Jones Lang LaSalle, and you just approved an extension of their contract at our last meeting, excels in the sustainability area. It isn't just something they do because their clients think it's important. It's embedded in their culture at Jones Lang LaSalle. So they, they really are an exceptional, exceptional partner for us. So they have competition among all the thousands of buildings they own and manage around the world um, for who's managing and engineering them the best. You know, who's doing the best job at energy management and what they're doing. You know where this is going in a minute. So um, you don't, I, I don't our, our engineers aren't here right now, are they? Okay, well, we have an engineering team um, that works for us in the building and they're part of the Jones Lang LaSalle team. So we know them all by name and, and really I think does everyone know their engineers, but they're, they're working throughout the building all the time, fine tuning um, the building we're in. So of 5,000, 5,000 buildings under Jones Lang LaSalle's oversight, Calistrus was named number one number one for a absolute perfect what we call energy star rating of 100 you're all familiar with energy star for appliances so there's energy star ratings for buildings as well and uh, we have the highest rating and receive the highest score among all of their buildings right. so how's about that that's a good grade that's a very <laughs> and this good building grade. is 10 years <laughs> old yeah, what yeah. do we get yeah, yeah we should get a sticker is there anything you get ice cream Oh, we'll get a plaque. Okay. <laughs> Make sure that goes somewhere where everybody can see it. That's great. So the uh, so that's cool. Then that, that's cool. again, this building's ten and a half years old, and it's still um, very well. So just a couple things on the report. Looking forward, um, uh, Karen and Dana and Sharon were with us last uh, uh, Thursday at uh, the City of West Sacramento's annual um, State of the City speech, where they really go over all the things that are going on in West Sacramento, where the innovation and development is happening, things they're doing in education. Karen's a former teacher with Washington Unified, so all her buddies were there. Um, and, uh, and again, I just wanted you to know that the mayor always underscores what an important partnership it is with us, and we're always called out always called out. I mean, we've had such a significant employment impact um, as restaurants start to develop and more amenities on the side of the river. Um, our expansion and what we bring in for tenants is, is so critical to the community. Our future daycare center, which will be open to people that live in West Sac, not just our employees, our assembly rooms, which we can rent out to the community. 
our larger cafe, which will be open to the public. All of these things brings relationships we've never had before with this community on the side of the river. So um, I, they, I hopefully you all enjoyed yourselves. And, and, yeah, and great. Heard, Should we put out a shout out for the West Side Coffee that's now open? Oh, the yeah. <laughs> Everyone seems to enjoy West Side. Down the street. That's really good, too. So our next milestone <laughs> event is next Wednesday. Uh, on May 15th, uh, Lisa and I will be at City Council and uh, making the final presentation on the plans with our architects and uh, oversight managers and everything. And, and we're hoping we get a positive vote and uh, it's a green light to move forward. Uh, the engineers, going back to the, the yeah, awards, oh, sure. do you wanna get in there? Do you wanna punch in there? They probably, they probably need a thank you too. Because okay. they're, they're critical for us. Yeah, yeah. and they're not, watching the, they're not watching <laughs> the board meeting. They better not be. So, uh, <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, we will yeah, do let so. Let them know how appreciative we are of their efforts on our behalf. I appreciate that. So anyway, so next Wednesday, we'll I'll give you just a quick email, uh, assuming it's a positive response from City Council and there's no final uh, concerns of everyone. Um, I don't know that I mentioned before, we, we have described some of the other developments for you, but the city is going ahead with putting a uh, dock for boats in front of our building here, and that will start shortly as well and be finished up by October, as we're thinking, right? Um, so um, they've wanted a, a, a landing on this side of the river, not just over on the other side, on the Sacramento side. So the city is, that's, we're not paying for any of that. That doesn't involve us, other than enjoying, a, you know, the sight of boats landing in front of our building. <laughs> and then uh, finally, just on the, uh, on the big issues coming up, uh, there's no budgetary issues to report other than concrete, which I mentioned in here, <laughs> is in fact, you know, one of the most principal elements of the building and that bid is coming up. So um, that'll be important for us to see how that prices out, to make sure we're still in within what we're saying. No um, design glitches have been identified at all. There's always fine tuning that going on in the design. We add something, take something away, um, but nothing that's um, threatened the budget at all at this point. So nothing to report on that front either. Uh, we've made some progress with some of the public agency reviews, so that's positive. Uh, you know, I had a, a great deal of concern last time we spoke with you, but there seems to be some progress in that area, which is great. And uh, I, we, we don't feel at this point the PG&E risk is, is serious enough to give us any concern. So that's where we are in the building. That's it. Thanks, Jack. Um, hang on one second. Karen. Thanks, Jack. Um, there was one thing that you mentioned about August and about the project starting. Yeah. Did I? Did I well, we'll, we'll start to very roughly, but we'll start to shut down the parking lot in the uh, what we call the surface lot in front okay. of the building just to do some uh, beginning the site preparation. But nothing much serious will happen until more like October, November. That's okay. when it, uh, when the bond offering takes place and, and all that okay. moves okay. forward. That was my next It's meant to but... sync with that. Okay. But there's some, some minor work that needs to be done, and we've got to get the parking part managed well since that's always an important right. issue. Right, and then the parking issue. I think I talked to staff about where members can still – member parking lot – Parking spaces will still be available in the places that are currently. Yeah, that are. won't change at all. Okay. Uh, it's the employee part that will be uh, impacted by that. By the way, interesting transportation statistic the three of us learned at the, uh, this will surprise you, uh, at the uh, city, city meeting. On this side of the river, they measure there are more people now that have taken jump, you know, the jump bikes and scooters yeah, in front of our building. The, the uh, use counts on those bikes and scooters now exceeds Uber rides. <laughs> on this side of the river. There are so many people using those jump bikes. Interesting. Thank you. One, one of the things Dan and I were just talking about is, have we ever thought about a way or a place where we can start showcasing all the awards that we're winning for different things? Like a, a way our members can kind of, hmm. not to just totally toot our own horn, but or even I, our staff. I just think for our staff and for our membership, it, it might be, I mean, that's pretty impressive out of 5,000, yeah, you know what on. I mean? Like, so I wonder if we could just give some thought to, okay. and I well, even I'm think of like, I don't want to be a gloater, but yeah. No, I totally get it, but like, I mean, yes, Ailman, and I mean, we've, we have incredible leadership, we have incredible things we've done, and again, we don't want to be gloaters, but I also think there's something about um, communicating to the people that come through our doors, yeah. that this is a world-class organization, that not just how we're managing the pensions, but how we're conducting business, and the people that work in this building, the building itself, um, just, you know, the level of performance. I just think 
It's, it says something. I'm not saying we need awards. I think people feel that when they come in the building yeah. and interact well, with us. But well, we'll take that as, a, as, a, as something to think of. We, we haven't designed all the uh, the, the, the uh, display aspects of the new expansion tower. So, you know, that's that's kind of our next thing that's to start right, thinking yeah. about. Maybe maybe, maybe a creative way the Portland architects yeah, can Yeah, well, we have a, yeah, it's, 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 at least just said we have a very long corridor leading to the assembly halls, yeah, which I mean, we haven't something put. creative, too. It doesn't need to be yeah. like an old trophy case, because I'm sure the... No, it'd be like Architects digital, can get creative, right? or maybe digital, of, or some yeah, ways. Yeah, that's a really good idea. So it could yeah. be rotating around. Yeah. But anyway, just something that Dana, did you want to add? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking that if and I, our communications department has won awards, correct? Oh, many. Yeah, many. So, it, so, it, but if those get housed in the communication department, then nobody else in the right. building gets to see them, enjoy right. them either. So it's not only is it sharing with our members, but it's sharing within the whole family that's Cowsters. Mm -hmm. I like the electronic idea because I, yeah. I assume we're just going to continue to win base. awards, so we need something rotating around so it doesn't get stagnant. So, right. All right. Uh, next week we'll do uh, town hall meetings with all of our employees that won't want to come, and uh, we will be actually showing them renderings of the new facility, um, kind of talking about who's moving into the facility, uh, uh, the amenities that we'll be talking about, all that stuff. So we want to start getting the staff to really understand uh, the impact. So that awesome. starts next week. Concrete. Exciting. Yeah, concrete. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. That's exciting. Um, oh, just, just go ahead, Karen. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. In addition to the digital, sometimes we get awards that are 3D. So make sure that we have space for that, too. Well, I think, Karen, what we were suggesting is, I mean, we could do that. But yeah. I think what we're, I, the idea oh, is yeah. instead of using kind of a static, like, trophy right, right. to make it more visual so that... So we could take a picture of the yeah. 3D. But where's the else. thing going to go? I mean, I guess yeah, that's what we can, I want. We'll I let want these the guys thing. figure it out. I want the thing to be somewhere. She wants the thing. Because <laughs> Pixar does it that way. Yeah. Okay. We're going to get a thing. Let's <laughs> okay. put it out. All right. We'll let, you guys, okay. we'll let you guys figure it out. Um, let's go on to item 13. And just, uh, just for reference, um, item 13, we've got five items. Uh, so we've got committee reports. Uh, approval of minutes from our March meeting. We've got board member education. We've got contracts requiring board approval. And then the um, E is internal investment management. Um, so typically in the past, what we do is we kind of, those are on consent and we sort of adopt them together. And what we typically do is, I think for the committee reports, we have a couple, I think from um, Dana, from... Uh, Comp and I believe Joy, audits, do you have yeah. you had an action item from audits, um, and the, so maybe the two of you can read your committee reports, and then board members, if there are other items within those five that you want pulled, is there any any items that you want pulled? Thirteen E, just a quick question. Okay, so we'll pull thirteen E. Um, okay, so not hearing any other committee reports being pulled. Um, why don't you read the committee reports and we can adopt 13A through 13D? Does Jeff that sound Joya. all right? Jeff Joya. Do I have okay. what? Joy. Oh. Is Joy, has Joy? No, there's no Joy. Yeah. You have somebody's name. Is Joy in there? She is not in there. Okay. <laughs> I'm now in there, right? Am I yes. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, David. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just was like. Oh, you put me in front? Know. Okay, I never mind. I didn't understand what you were doing. That's okay. okay. <laughs> I usually wait. Never mind. That's all right. I was after Joy, so that's why I was funny. Okay. Okay, so on behalf of the Compensation Committee, I move the following items. I have one, two, three, four items. Um, do you want me to do all of them all at once, or you want yeah. me to do one at a time for a vote? What, what's, what, let's do them all at once. All at once. Yeah. All right. Okay. By direction of the Compensation Committee, I move to adopt the increase to the base salary range for the general counsel position with a minimum salary of 308000 mid-range 384000 and a maximum of 455000 those are all dollars, effective July 1st, 2020, and an interim salary range minimum of $305,000 for fiscal year 19 and 20. I also move to adopt the increase to the base salary range for the associate portfolio manager position with a minimum salary range of $120,000, mid-range of $150,000, and a maximum of $180,000, effective July 1st, 2019. I also move to adapt or adopt the annual incentive opportunity levels for fiscal year 2019-20 and fiscal year 2021 to the ranges recommended in alternative two of the report on labor benchmarking for statutory positions. 
And finally, by direction of the committee, I move to adopt the revisions to the compensation committee charter to allow the committee to hold meetings on dates other than regular board and committee meeting dates and to allow the committee to delegate components of the compensation program administration to the CEO. Thank you. All right, and Joy, do you want to read the action item for audits? Okay, so by direction of the Audits and Risk Management Committee, I move to adopt the proposed amendments to the Audits and Risk Management Committee Charter. Great. So with those two, can we go ahead and adopt 13A through G. D? Do we move need approval. To? Second. Okay, it's been moved and approved. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? So, um, so just so you know, Keith is um, abstaining from the, the comp item. All right, are we okay? Uh, we're just checking oh, sure. Okay. So here, do you mind just, just no so we'll make sure we have it right? Is it everything okay? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I I, no, I appreciate the, okay. the second pair of eyes. Absolutely. Okay. Great. So then we are looking at item 13E. Uh, Karen wanted to pull up that. So, Karen, did you have a specific question? Um, I talked to staff about it earlier, and about, I was just confused about the, we, I know that we approved the 15, 55 spots for the five years, and I, I guess I just wanted an explanation of the, um, the term that we used to, uh, okay, what is that word that we used? The drawdown. Drawdown, draw right, drawdown. And then, um, so, and then after, so then we, we draw down, so that means we're gonna use, put the positions in the three years as opposed to the five years. Correct. And so after the three years, then do you have a plan for what happens after that? And then um, talking about people, uh, I guess you'll figure out where the people are gonna go that get hired as a result of this drawdown. Deborah Smith, Chief Operating Investment Officer, and Scott Chan, our Deputy CIO, has joined as well. So yes, we do have a plan after the drawdown. So just to put it in context, so our we have a multi-year budget change proposal that was um, implemented a couple years ago, and it was a five-year plan, and it had positions for each fiscal year through those five years, and that plan, that multi-year BCP was put in place before, while we were researching the collaborative model. Now that we're implementing the collaborative model, we needed to draw down those positions from five years to three years. Mm -hmm. So we worked with Julie and her team and financial services branch as to how do we draw down additional positions. So we were slated to get 12 positions for fiscal year 1920 through the regular process. The other positions, those 15, were in other fiscal years. So Scott and I reached out to our respective teams and was like, okay, how many positions do you need to support the collaborative model? And it happened to be 27. Well, we only had 12, so the balance is those 15 positions. So we worked with um, Julie, and we're continuing to work with human resources to make sure that we have that um, human talent, human capital that we need in order to implement the collaborative model. Scott? That was uh, perfect. Thank, thank you, Deborah. I just wanted to add one, one comment, which is that we've, we've drawn up longer range plan, plans, as you know, for the collaborative model and the execution of internalizing uh, more, more of our assets. Um, so it's likely that we will come forward uh, for another multi-year plan um, after this. And it'll probably be, I'm forgetting, is it? September, Jan November. September, November. Thank you, Jack. Yeah. 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 And then the second part about the, where the, the space, bodies are gonna the space be. space planning. Well, we're definitely going to look to Lisa to assist with that. It's a body. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I mean, like live bodies. I mean, not. <laughs> People no, worry about the house. Because as a teacher, I always teacher, think so. about where my students are going to be when I'm doing a certain yeah. activity. So, Am I going to have all the materials at this, 
you know, point A or point B or whatever. So in in visualizing all this, I'm a visual person. I wanted, I, I'm kind yeah. of wondering, I, I, you know, I, and I'm sure you've thought about it, but but is it? You want to go? Yeah. I I kind of want to get an idea. Sure, I'll I'll start while while Lisa's coming up. So we have planned in the investment branch, we plan for our growth throughout all of our fiscal years. And we knew that we were gonna run out of space June of this year. So we have been consistently working on this challenge for a long time. Um, we also had a group that, um, an investment branch that was led by Scott to look at investments, where w if we'd be in this building, if we'd be in the new building, if we're going to be in this building, which I believe we are, what floors do we occupy? So we've been working closely with Lisa and her team on the interim plan, just in case we get those 15 positions sooner than. Okay. Yeah, we made the decision after the board decided, approved the expansion, that we were not gonna have, we weren't gonna look for interim space somewhere else. We were gonna use the space that we have in this building, because it's just it's the most prudent thing to do. And so we do have pockets of, of space available that's not necessarily the right size for um, a staff person, but we are going to accommodate people the best that we can. And so we're gonna be moving some people around and we're gonna be looking at spaces that we can maybe condense down to, to a smaller workstation size, like we're gonna be doing in the expansion earlier, just to fit the number of people that we, we need to fit into the building. And so um, we, do have, we do have facilities uh, staff that are actively looking at the pockets that we have available. We do have a vacancy always as well. So we'll be looking at the best place to put people in the interim to make sure that um, we can ride out the next, you know, 30 months before we can actually move into the new building. So um, we'll make it work. Yeah. I just want everybody to be happy. <laughs> well, there might be some disruption well, in the well, next, sure, in the next. If it's temporary, then, yeah. You know. And I think people are more amenable to, you know, something um, that's less, you know, less comfortable um, as long as they know it's temporary. And so, yeah, you we are definitely- like a teacher, Lisa. Yeah, we are <laughs> definitely yeah, sending those messages that, the, you know, and, and the town halls when we talk on Monday, um, Jack and I start the town halls on Monday, um, there are gonna be some disruptions and we wanna make sure we're transparent with that, that the employees know from a parking perspective or from a space perspective yeah. that things may not be easy over the next 24 months, mm -hmm. um, but they just have to bear with us and uh, know that it's a temporary situation and what comes at the end is something much better, so. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anything else, Karen? Nope, that's okay. it. Thank you Fair very enough. much. Thank Fair you. I, I think several times when we've talked um, about um, additional staffing and, and this item in particular, we've talked about to implement the collaborative model, but I would imagine this would be the staffing to begin to implement the collaborative model because we will definitely have to hire more staff as we move through that process right. to get it done. So I just wanted to say something to make sure that there wasn't any misperception that we're only going to need this many people to implement the collaborative model. No, I'm, I'm no. picturing the size of last okay. Anything else on that item? Um, just one. Uh, we need to prove it. Well, I, before we approve it, <laughs> um, I just wanted to bring up the board education item, the 13C, um, because there have been a couple changes. So you should have a, the most current copy at your at, um, at your chair. Um, so I just want to make sure people kind of saw some additions, as well as for new board members. I know some folks are thinking about different board education items. Um, you know, we have board education items on the board website. You can always talk to Jack or any of us on the board who've been around for a while. Um, and you can certainly, even though we approve education typically at every board meeting, if there is something that's coming up and it, it's happening um, before the next board meeting, just check in with, with me or with Jack and we can make sure we approve it. And so don't feel constrained um, in terms of time because we, um, we encourage board, board education. We love it when... Um, we all need to learn so much, so we're looking forward to having you guys take advantage of that. So with that said, um, any other questions? Um, let, uh, I would, did you move already? I can't remember. No, no. <laughs> okay. Can someone um, move approval? Move 13E. 13A through D. I'll second it. Oh, through 18A through E. Okay, it's been moved in second. Oh, I'm sorry, that's, we're doing e, e, right? Sorry, yeah, just, just E, 13E. 
Uh, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. And one abstention, right? One abstention? Yep. Okay, got it. Great. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, let's move on to, okay, so item 14, items referred by committee for board decision. Okay, <laughs> I'm like, what is that? Um, item 15, new business, review information requests. You hear anything, Jennifer? Um, no, item 16 is our draft agenda for the next board meeting. So just, uh, just, just fitting with the change we made in the work plan on item number six, the pension solution update, that's a, that part of that will have to be in probably an action item because okay. it will be a budgetary item to just to reset the budget for the non-CGI part of the project. So just, okay. that was the only thing I noticed right away. Okay. Yeah. God bless you. Any questions? All right. Uh, opportunities for statements from the public. Oh my goodness. Nobody wants to speak from the public today. I just want to We've say. We've done it enough. He just wanted to give me our deck. Actual, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> so, um, so just for, for review for everyone, um, what we'll do is we'll start tomorrow morning. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jack, but tomorrow morning we'll start at 9 a.m. Oh, yeah, we thought, you know, we did two long days. Yep. So, and, and so sleep in. We'll start with the Cal Savers item and yeah. then go to Punch and Solution and then go into closed session. So that does mean you're, you don't have to. Uh, that does mean we'll, that time is not going to be right on the public agenda. We have like a 2, two four, What is it, 245? Yeah, you'll be you'll be earlier than that for sure. Uh, I'm sorry. And then two forty-five. Well, the notices is that the conclusion. Always gives the uh, the public the idea that it it is a follow-on meeting. It's not a time set. Okay. But you could be an hour or two but, earlier potentially. Yeah. So the more no, advance notice we give them today, the more comfortable I am that. Well, you might three. be available. Maybe three. Yeah. What? Yeah. What? Uh, what but the three? good news is, you know, it was a very, it was really the, the heart of your agenda was about I mean, you. I think our close, Ooh, I think our close session will take a little while. So I would, I would probably guess, you know, like, like one, you know, maybe one o'clock. Yeah, that's right. We'll I was, have lunch. That's after. what I was guessing. Little I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just throwing it out there. Is that, okay. I just don't like to say things that long because, you know, that jinx it. So. <laughs> So, okay, great. Well, for today, we are adjourned. So we are starting with item eight. So I thought Katie was, yeah, I was going to say, I was expecting her to, welcome, Katie. <laughs> I was confused. So welcome, Katie. We're going to hear about CalSavers, and we're really excited to have you um, here. And I think it's so important to just, I mean, obviously, CalSavers, we care a lot about retirement security for teachers and having a secure retirement for all workers in California is really important to us. So welcome to CalSavers and look forward to hearing what's going on with CalSavers. Oh, thank you very much. Is this on? Okay. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the board. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, to introduce CalSavers to you today. I'm Katie Selensky, the Executive Director of the California Secure Choice Retirement Savings Investment Board, which oversees the CalSavers Retirement Savings Program. Um, this is a really exciting moment for us in our history. We are seven weeks from our full mm -hmm. statewide launch. Right. So as you can imagine, things are very busy, but we're very happy to be here to um, introduce, reintroduce you to the program. Um, I want to thank Mr. Enos and Mr. Boykin for their support over the last couple of years and their encouragement and answering our questions and uh, just being generally supportive. Um, of course, Mr. Boykin has a special understanding of, of, of our operations having come from the state treasurer's office. Um, and if you'll indulge me, I'd like to just take a moment to introduce uh, three members of my management team who are with me here in the audience today. Our deputy director, Brian Gould, whom many of you will remember from his time here at Cal Sturs. Uh, thank you for letting us steal him away from your Pension 2 program. Um, well, we have his wife hostage here still. <laughs> That's so, right. So, so it's still in the family here. Yeah. Uh, and then <laughs> uh, Eric Lawyer is our policy manager, and some of you may recognize him uh, in, from the recent past. Uh, 
from his periodic sitting in Mr. Rafino's seat uh, for the former Treasurer Chung. Uh, he is our policy manager. And then our outreach manager, Jonathan Herrera, who uh, does not, to my knowledge, have a Kelsters connection, but, um, but I'm, sure, I'm sure there's something in there. But you know, manages one of our most important functions, which is outreach and really getting the word out, which is really why we're here today. So thank you uh, from my team for being here. And so what we'll do today is just give a brief update on the history of CalSAVERS. I know many of you are familiar with this already, but we'll, for those of you who are new to the program, we'll go over the history quickly and the basics of the program. We'll talk about the status of implementation. And then I have an ask or a few asks of all of you if you would be so kind as to entertain sure. that. So here is a little picture of our wonderful board. These are my nine bosses. Of course, our board is chaired by the state treasurer, Fiona Ma. Um, we have three, uh, three seats overlapping with your own board here. And this, this board is composed of experts in uh, the retirement industry, labor, um, pensions, and, and other uh, com important community issues that help advise us in our work. So let's just start with kind of Stepping back and reminding ourselves of the problem, I think this board, uh, your mission is, you know, of course, aligned with ours, which is to improve retirement security for all. Um, but it, you know, I think it bears repeating why we're here and why this program exists. Uh, quite simply, nearly half of Californians, nearly half of working Californians, are projected to retire into economic hardship, and that is defined as two times the federal poverty limit or below. Understanding what our you know high cost of living is here in California, that's really that's really saying something. So, um, to me, that's profound, and it's worth reminding ourselves of that every day um, as we come to work and do this important important work. And that's you know really a, not only a moral problem that any society should want to solve, but uh, it's a fiscal problem too from the state's perspective and from the taxpayers' perspective because of course. Um, the more impoverished elders we have, uh, the more strain we have on our government, limited government resources. So um, we know that one of the biggest drivers of this problem is an access gap. So in California, there are an estimated seven and a half million hardworking Californians who you know, go to work every day, follow the rules, and yet don't have access to a workplace retirement savings vehicle. Um, which is really important for reasons that I'll talk about in just a moment. The, we have a detailed breakdown of what the 7.5 million population looks like in the back of this PowerPoint presentation, but just high level, two-thirds of them work for small businesses, two-thirds are people of color, and 58% are women. Now, the good news is that uh, it's, it, since we do have this big access gap, that the solutions are really not rocket science. So uh, we know that people, when they have access to a workplace-based uh, payroll deduction form of savings, they're 15 times more likely to save for retirement and be on a path to retirement security. And when you make that automatic enrollment, it's 20 times more likely. So really, these very simple facts were the basis of uh, the beginning of uh, CalSAVERS, which was formerly known as, as Secure Choice. So I won't go over every one of these uh, points in our history, and many of you are familiar with this, but just to kind of um, illustrate that this has been in the works for a very long time, and there's been a lot of very, very careful thought and study put into the design and implementation of this program. Of course, Senator DeLeon from Los Angeles uh, began looking at this issue 11 years ago, um, consulted with experts uh, around the state, stakeholders, uh, experts in Washington, D.C., and uh, by 2012 had kind of come up with the bones of what secure choice, of, of what CalSAVERS is today. And we were the very first state to pass um, a, an, an act, a uh, secure choice style program that applied to all private sector workers in 2012. So while uh, a couple of states have snuck around us on implementation, which is okay. We were the first uh, on, on, uh, on the legislation, so everyone should be happy about that. Um, the, the feasibility study was done, and then the final version of the legislation was uh, passed in the fall of 2016. So for the past two years, we have been working very hard to uh, work with stakeholders and hire all of the wonderful uh, private sector partners that we're working with and working with our board to really design the program and to get it off the ground. We um, 
launched the six-month pilot in at the end of 2018. The first contributions came into the pilot uh, on January 3rd, 2019, which we're really happy about. And that brings us to today. So we're in the second half of our pilot right now. We'll talk about the status of the pilot more in a moment um, and tell you how that's going. But to pause, uh, I mentioned the other couple of states that had snuck around us on implementation. So Oregon and Illinois, um, and we're, we're very happy for them, and we're, we're actually quite happy to be third in implementation. It's, it's really helpful to be able to draw from their insights. Yeah. Um, they're both uh, in the first year or so of their implementation. Uh, in addition to that, Maryland, Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York have passed legislation and are in the various stages of hiring staff and beginning mm -hmm. to get up and running. Uh, there are other forms of re state-sponsored retirement uh, programs that are being considered and implemented around the country. Uh, these ones that I'm showing here are the kind of automatic enrollment IRA, similar to what we're doing here. Um, and then those, those 20 bills that have been pending this session kind of cover the whole range of types of uh, solutions that are being proposed. Um, you may or may not be familiar with the open uh, multi-employer plans, proposals that are moving forward at both at the state and federal level right now. There is uh, quite a bit of activity in the US Congress right now um, to explore different iterations of, of government-sponsored retirement savings nudges, and uh, we're monitoring those closely. We do expect some action this year and then potentially uh, sort of more what I would say aggressive action um, in the next couple of years. So the two most sort of powerful features of the CalSAVERS program are, one, we have uh, an employer requirement. So all employers in the state with five or more employees, if you don't already offer some kind of retirement savings vehicle, then you either have to go get one <laughs> off of the private market like you can right now, or provide access to CalSAVERS for your employees. So just wanna be really clear that the, the requirement, the mandate is not for employers to uh, sign up for CalSAVERS, it's for them to offer something. I try to make that very clear when I'm in front of industry audiences as well, because we, we see this as a potential opportunity for innovation in the private sector, which is a good thing. Um, and then the second really important, powerful policy lever here is the automatic enrollment for employees. It is totally voluntary. Uh, but if they don't want to participate, if they don't want to save, they will have to actively opt out. Now they can set, we have a set of default uh, contribution uh, settings that I'll go over in a moment. Um, they can change those. So if they want to participate at a more modest level, they can do that. But these are two really, you know, pretty powerful features that the behavioral economists and policy experts throughout the country believe are kind of the secret sauce to helping uh, really move the needle on retirement security. And then pausing just for a moment to talk about the implementation. So as I said, we're mid-pilot. Uh, we open fully statewide in seven weeks on July 1st, 2019. And then we have, uh, in terms of employer compliance, uh, we have a set of three staggered deadlines over the next three years uh, by employer size, as you can see here. So we're starting with the biggest employers. They'll have a year to comply. Uh, the 50 or more employ employers will have uh, two years, and then the smallest businesses will have three years to comply with the mandate. So what actually is it? What are some of, what are some of those policy features here? So as I mentioned, it's automatic enrollment. Um, when, when folks are participating, they won't have to go in and do anything at all. Every, every payroll, it'll be automatically uh, deducted. Their contributions will be automatically deducted into uh, an individual retirement account. It's the default setting is a Roth IRA, and it's governed by all the same kind of federal uh, laws and policies that govern any other IRA. So it works, if, if any of you on the board have an IRA, it's, it's that. Um, as I said, it's completely voluntary, um, and folks can opt out at any time. Um, it is, you know, we're trying to make it as simple as possible. Um, what we've learned from all of the research is that, uh, especially with regard to investments, less is, less is more, um, and making things simple and intuitive is really, um, what we want to be doing. There is automatic, uh, escalation of contributions. Um, again, people can opt out of that if they choose to. We'll sh say more about that in a moment. Portable from job to job. So if I am currently participating and I leave to go to another employer, if that employer is a CalSAVERS facil facilitating employer, 
Um, I don't have to do anything, basically. I, my, my new contributions at my new employer will go into the same account. If I, if I leave and go uh, to a non-CalSavers facilitating employer where, for example, there may be a 401k, I still get to keep, keep my CalSavers account. It, I can either just leave it there and let it grow, um, or I can roll it over into another um, a similar account. Um, and so, you know, we felt that, I think the, the board felt that that was very important to uh, make it portable given the shifts in our economy. Similarly, gig workers are allowed in. So while the main portion, the main, you know, uh, the, the heart of the program is, is uh, designed to be uh, facilitated by the employer, the board decided that, you know, they looked around the state and saw that the shifts in our economy and there are a lot more self-employed people, gig workers, and those folks should be able to participate if they want to as well. So if they hear about us and decide they want to have a CalSavers account, they can simply go online, create an account, and link their bank account and contribute on their own that way. Same goes for uh, employees who are in a more traditional employee-employer relationship who work for a non-mandated employer, a non-CalSavers employer. If they have a 401k, but for whatever reason want to also contribute to a CalSavers account, they can sign up and, and add uh, to their account that way. Zero cost to taxpayers and the state. This was part of the um, authorizing legislation. It was very important, I think, to the legislature to make sure that this is a self-sustaining program that's really floated just based on the fees uh, charged to the, to the participants. So we are operating right now on a startup loan from the legislature. Um, which we will pay back with interest. I'm going to say more about why this is important and how this affects our marketing and outreach efforts in a moment, and it's related to my request of all of you. Um, and then, of course, it, it's also built into the statute and the legislation that this is a public-private partnership. So this, while we have a very lean staff, wonderful, brilliant staff here at the State Treasurer's Office, um, it's small and it's going to stay small uh, most likely because we... Uh, are required, really, to work with private sector financial services firms. So a census is the program administrator, the record keeper. Um, they also run the customer service function, the website, um, and uh, really are, are really administering the program. State Street Global Advisors is running four of our five investment options. We just added Newton uh, to run our fifth option, which is an ESG fund. We're very excited about that. AKF Consulting is our general consultant. Makita, whom you all know, of course, is our investment consultant. And k &L Gates is our uh, legal and regulatory advisor. Katie, is the customer service piece here in California or some other area? Um, it's spread out across a few states. Through other districts, yeah. okay. Yep. And then, of course, we are transparently governed by the public board chaired by the treasurer. So if, a little bit more detail on our features. I've said some of this already. So the default, since we know that somewhere between 80 and 95% of our participants aren't immediately going to go in and kind of tinker with their settings and customize their settings, it's important to have a set of default settings. So uh, the default contribution rate is 5%, and we landed on that after sort of vigorous engagement with our stakeholders, what, you know, what was the right amount, looking at the research, looking at um, behaviors around, you know, if it's too high, folks might opt out. If it's too low, it's not really moving the needle. So 5% is the default setting uh, with one percentage point automatic escalation uh, for the first few years and up until 8%. Now, of course, anyone, can, they, they can set it as low as 1%. They can actually set it as high as 100% as long as they don't exceed the federal dollar amount maximum, $6,000 this year. Um, for the majority of working age uh, uh, Americans. Um, as I said, it, the default is a Roth IRA. Can By you mention why you chose that versus the uh, the traditional ISC? Did the other programs choose a default Roth? Is that the... Certainly, yes. Um, Oregon and uh, Illinois both chose Roth. Mm -hmm. uh, we are we sort of led the charge on adding a traditional as, a, as an option. Okay. Um, and it was a it was an interesting policy debate with with our board. I think um, we take our mission to serve retirement security very seriously. So there was an argument that traditional might be better because it essentially it locks locks the money and it makes it a little bit harder to access and um, encourages people to really leave the money there and invest it for the long term. Um, but when we when we really dug into it deeper and engage with stakeholders, I think a couple of the drivers on choosing Roth were, um, number one, because our population is young and low income, 
just mathematically, it sort of works out better for them financially in the long run to start out in a Roth so that they, basically so that they're paying the taxes on a lower, on a lower base, at, at, a, at a lower level, at a lower tax rate, essentially. Assuming they progress in their financial lives, yeah. um, later right. on they'll be at a higher rate. Yeah. So kind of financially, they, they're served better by a Roth, the majority of our population. And then I would say equally importantly, um, a lot of our consumer advocates and, and sort of advocates for lower income workers felt that it was really important for our savers to have access, as easy access to the funds as possible. So um, essentially withdrawals from a Roth are uh, much easier, right? Tax and penalty free in, in almost every instance. So since, since we're talking about a population of folks, some of whom have never even had a bank account, savings, you know, investing is new for them and savings might even be new for them. We didn't want to put people in a situation where they, you know, car breaks down um, and you have to choose between, you know, losing your job and yep. uh, leaving your money there. So it was really those kind of sensitivity to the cash flow constraints. And you'll be able to get good leakage data. So you'll, after a while, it's given from the TPA. Exactly. And we'll okay. be watching that really closely. Yeah, I think that'd be great yes. for us to all to understand that. Yes. Thank great. you for the question. It was, it was a, uh, it took several board meetings for us to kind of come to a consensus on that. And it was something we took really, really seriously, but essentially informed by stakeholder feedback. Investments, as I mentioned, we have uh, five options total. The default for the first $1,000 is a capital preservation fund. Well, what we call a capital preservation fund, it's essentially a money market fund. And for those reasons that I just um, mentioned, uh, you know, felt that it was important for folks to have essentially a little bit of a buffer account for in cases of emergency. There's a lot of interesting um, research going on in, in D.C. and in the policy sphere around sidecar accounts. You're probably familiar with some of these discussions. This is kind of our little mini version of a sidecar account of, a, of emergency savings. Um, all subsequent dollars after the first thousand go into a target date fund. And then we have a global equity option and... Um, and a core bond fund, and then the new ESG fund, which is offered by Newton. We're really excited about um, all of those. So, of course, anyone can choose any of these five options at any time, but the default settings are those first two that I mentioned. And we'll be watching kind of patterns and behavior around that uh, very closely as we go forward. Fees, we have the most aggressively declining fees uh, of, among our peers uh, at these state-sponsored programs. When we get to scale, um, we will be... Uh, the very lowest in the industry. Um, the record keeper, a census, uh, as part of their contract, has committed to a, a breakpoint schedule where uh, basically as we hit every $5 billion um, AUM milestone, our fees go down. So we're really, really proud of that and um, excited to get to scale so we can get to those lower fees. Um, and in the back of this presentation is a summary of the fees if you'd like to see that. Accessibility, this is very, it shouldn't be the last bullet point. I got to move it up. This is, um, this is really, really important to the staff and the board that we're not only kind of physically accessible with a mobile app and a and, you know, customer service function, but that we are culturally accessible and culturally competent and appropriate. So the mobile app, which is launching on July 1st with everything else, is bilingual. Um, the customer service call center is multilingual. You can call um, and speak in any any language under the sun. Um, and our website is trilingual right now. And by the end of uh, the calendar year, we will have the main, main pages of our website will be available in six languages. So we're really proud of that. Expected impact. So some of you may know um, Dr. Nari Re, a labor economist at yes at uh, UC Berkeley. Um, she here's a little snapshot of, of one of her reports from last year, which we were so thrilled um, to read. She found that the combined impact of the Cal Savers program and the state's minimum wage policy um, would result in a 50 percent increase in young low income workers' retirement incomes in, in retirement. So that is. Um, that is even better than we thought it would be, and we're just absolutely thrilled about that. And we can't wait to see that bear out. Another way to look at impact, um, this is just, you know, a scenario, of course, you know, uh, your mileage may vary here, but um, 
This is a, a snapshot of a CalSaver who participates with us starting at age 25 and sticks with it for 40 years for their whole career until age 65 under the default settings and never tinkers with any of the settings. So again, starting at that 5% rate, escalating up to eight, and then staying at 8% for the remainder of their career, assuming a fairly, you know, I think reasonable conservative return assumption of 5% over that 40 years. Um, you know, they're going to end up with 350, they could end up with $350,000 at the end of that, only one third of which is coming from their own contributions, two thirds from growth. So we like to show this, especially to younger audiences who are new to the concept of uh, compound interest and this kind of, there's a, we would like to think there's a little wow factor there. Um, now I will say that sometimes when I'm in front of, um, maybe asset management audiences, uh, this, I've gotten the question on more than one occasion, like, well, that's not very much. That's not going to move the needle on, you know, uh, poverty in, in retirement years, to which I say, well, when you come, that's fair and good for you for having that point of view. Congratulations. But the, um, <laughs> the point is that we're comparing this to a situation where half of American households are subsisting really on, on Social Security alone, right? Half of them have barely anything saved for retirement when they're within spitting distance of, of, of retirement age. So when you compare this to that, this is profound and we're really excited. And of course, we know that hopefully, you know, we don't have folks in CalSavers for their entire careers. Hopefully they kind of move on in their lives and get, you know, get into a, a position where they're being offered a 401k or some kind of benefit by their employer and don't need CalSavers. But if they, if they do stick with it, then, you know, th this, this could be a scenario and we're pretty, um, we're pretty moved by this. Um, so from the, so that's all kind of from the consumer saver perspective, just wanted to touch for a moment on the employer's perspective, because as we know, there is a employer requirement. Sometimes we use the word mandate to describe it, uh, which is a fair description. Um, but it's, it's really important that uh, everyone understand that we're doing everything we possibly can to make this as easy, um, as possible for them. So what we hear from, uh, survey research and kind of focus groups uh, on small business employers is that there are three main reasons they're not offering uh, 401ks or other savings vehicles right now. And number one, cost, their, their particular cost to the employer of starting something up, the administrative burden, figure, doing all the research to figure it out, which one should they pick, and then ongoing reporting requirements and all of that complexity. And then third, the fiduciary liability that comes with, with sponsoring an, uh, uh, a plan. So Cal CalSavers was designed specifically to address all three of these things. There are no fees for employers to facilitate. We are making it as easy as humanly possible for them to do so, and we are making improvements every day, and it's going to improve over the, over the next few years as we uh, continue our work, uh, especially with the payroll services industry, to integrate technology. Uh, and then employers are not fiduciaries of CalSavers. They don't have fiduciary risk. So... Uh, we're really happy to be able to address all three of those concerns and have heard uh, from folks in the field that they are eager to have the opportunity to participate here and, and facilitate something for their employees. So I won't go, I won't take much time on this, but really it's very minimal for them. It takes, you know, just a couple of minutes to register. Uh, then they upload their roster to us. After they upload the roster, we take it from there, really. We do all the communication. We enroll the folks. We give them all the disclosures. We educate them. We run the call center. Um, so, you know, once we get the roster, we're really engaging directly with the employees. Now, the employer does need to facilitate the de the deduction, the payroll deduction, every payroll. That is, that's really the bread and butter of what they have to do. That, that experience is going to vary for them based on what their payroll services mm -hmm. situation is. So it's going to range from people writing paper checks uh, uh, in their, you know, uh, corner store to having a relationship with Paychex or ADP or one of the big payroll companies. And then lots of small, you know, lots of variation in the middle there. And that's actually... Um, our staff is spending a lot of time right now engaging with all that gray area and really engaging with the payroll services industry to standardize this stuff as much as possible. And there's some, there's going to be some exciting news for us to share um, on the technology that we're developing that will hopefully be kind of widely universally accessible uh, later this year. Um, just to be really clear, employers are not making an employer contribution. They, they may not. They're not allowed to, for better or worse. That is one of the requirements of... Uh, that, that we have to uh, enforce in order to stay outside of ERISA territory. 
Um, they're not answering questions from their staff, and we know that it will happen. Employers will get questions. We tell them, send them to us. Don't answer the questions. Send them to us. Send them to the call center. Um, they're not making any changes, so if the employee decides they want to change their rate or change their investment, we do that with them, not the employer. Uh, really, really, they're not providing investment <laughs> advice. And they actually are not allowed to encourage or discourage uh, participation. So that's something that we're having to um, be very clear about when we talk with employers. Is that an ERISA thing? Yeah, Maybe, it's an, no? yeah exactly. It so <laughs> it's part of uh, the safe harbor uh, four-prong test. So, And then uh, we already talked about this, so I'll just be – oops, I don't know if I go backwards here. Yeah, so again, no, uh, no cost to the state. We're operating on that loan. And eventually, that second point there, we believe that this will be a net positive for the general fund because <laughs> as there is a reduced um, – reduced demand on, on public services. So how's it going so far? So we are, you know, five months into our, uh, into our pilot, and um, this is such a dry slide to, uh, to describe it. I have a couple of pictures after this, but uh, folks like numbers. So we kept, the, we kept the pilot very small, very intentionally, just 60 employers, 30 in the first half, 30 in the second half, and that second half is just – pretty much still onboarding right now. The employees are still in their 30-day opt-out window. So the the numbers below are really don't reflect the second half of the employers coming on board. But the, the purpose in keeping it small was so that we could really carefully observe their experiences and you know engage with them, have sit with them uh, in person, talk with them on the phone, watch them via you know web, Zoom, and really watch how they engage in the portal. And so we've made lots of kind of technical tweaks to the platform and the experience based on what we've observed there. So it's been really, really valuable. Um, and by and large, we've heard uh, very positive reviews. Um, so as of a couple of days ago, we had 782 funded accounts, um, another 338 that were uh, enrolled but awaiting their first payroll, and then almost 2,000 actually that are in that 30-day opt-out period. So we're not sure if you know some of them will opt out and some of them will enroll. Um, but the opt-out rate it goes up and down a lot every day in these early early low volume days. But it's you know kind of hovering right around 30 percent, which is pretty darn close to what was um, anticipated in the feasibility study. And it's very consistent with what's happening in the other two states. So I, I take it as... Um, that, seems high, that seems high to me. I'm just, my first reaction is like 30% opting out. Because in general, it seems like people just don't pay attention to this stuff. I um, so, but, I, but you're saying it's within the average of other... Yeah, the other two states are at 30%. The feasibility study had um, assumed 25%, so it's a little bit higher than that. But, um, you know, I do think that, I, you know, I take it as a good thing. It, it shows that people are, you know, engaging and paying attention. Um, same for the 4.95% average contribution rate. So the default contribution rate is 5%. Um, as much as I would love the average contribution rate to be above the default rate, it's, you know, to me it shows that folks are deciding to take it down a notch instead of opting out. And I would, I would prefer to see them doing that. Do, do what's appropriate for their particular household budget than to opt out entirely. Um, but we'll be monitoring and reporting on the opt out rate as we go along. Um,